Good afternoon, and uh, I will uh, talk about the interconnect we are developing at Mellanox, a uh, little bit about what we have, a little bit about what we are heading to, and uh, then you know we'll take a questions. So uh, the thing starts today. We are in the data explosion phase, where data grows exponentially, and uh, the need for processing the data and uh, looking for what you really need. Uh, first of all, there is a big opportunity here, and the second one, there is a big challenge here. Because processing data that is collected today, not only the uh, amount of data, but the way it's actually managed and stored, it's what's called unstructured data. It is uh, a lot of data comes from uh, you know cell phones and uh, photos and uh, stuff that people uh, keep on the web. And uh, there is a great opportunity to use this data for uh, business and uh, research purposes. Okay, you can have uh, uh, talk, people talk about uh, Internet of Things. So there is going to be, uh, even today there are, and uh, there is a n number of sensors and a number of data sources is growing. And uh, once you have this data available and you can process this data and convert it to the information, then uh, there is an opportunity to have a different way, to enable different way of living. Okay, you can prevent traffic instead of avoid, avoiding traffic. You can have uh, real-time uh, alerts for the health, uh, health issues. And, uh, you know, you can... And, uh, of course, there's a, a significant uh, amount of uh, business intelligence that can be done. Uh, one of our guys uh, in uh, Mellanox was looking for some uh, uh, fishing equipment on the web. And uh, a few days later, he was uh, walking uh, in Santa, near Santa Row, and he got a message on his cell phone that the stuff he was looking for on the web a few days ago is actually available on the store today. So this is the uh, example how we can uh, use the data uh, and uh, uh, associate the data with, the, uh, with uh, growing your business. So ability to access the data at real time uh, requires processing, different processing capabilities, it requires a new architecture of the storage. There is a, now there is an additional storage tier, which is the uh, flash-based uh, storage uh, servers that have only not only significantly higher bandwidth but also much lower latency. And uh, connecting these tiers and connecting to, to the computing and uh, managing it and running it in a way that it is always available and always up it uh, presents uh, a new challenges on the networking or the media that connects this. And uh, actually, the, not only bandwidth and the latency, which are sort of the uh, you know, nuts and bolts of uh, network performance, but also the way the network interfaces are exposed to the application is, becomes, becomes critical. So uh, being able to access the data on, uh, different, on, uh, uh, across the network at lower cost in terms of the target of the data is RDMA, uh, and it significantly improves the performance of applications in general and storage in particular. Uh, running, uh, basically handling all the networking uh, stuck in the NIC rather than the CPU obviously uh, enables to uh, use the CPU for the application. And uh, another trend that we are uh, having now is with this cloud and web 2.0, people are actually using overlay networks, so uh, basically segregating the physical and logical uh, network infrastructure. So you can have a, a data center as a service, which is uh, basically public cloud is about. So going to the technology, uh, when you have a big, big challenge, there is always high-end technologies that waterfalls down. And uh, we talked about the network efficiency, and uh, this is a chart taken from the uh, top 500 uh, analysis, uh, showing basically the CPU utilization of, uh, uh, of or efficiency of the, uh, uh, of the different interconnects. And what you see here is that the blue dots, which is uh, infinite interconnect that connects about half of the top 500 uh, machines, 
uh, gets to the uh, 80 to 95, 90, 98% is the top uh, utilization number, which means that out of the theoretical 100% flops that you can get out of the machine that you build, you can uh, actually use 90% uh, and even more for the application and only a uh, fraction of the compute power goes to the network. Comparing to Ethernet, where it is about 50% uh, uh, utilization, and uh, newcomers GPU are not fully exploring uh, the interconnect and uh, capabilities, and it's so also in some cases uh, pretty low. And I'll talk about the uh, optimizations for the uh, GPU on the network uh, in in particular. Okay, so uh, since uh, about Almost two, more than two and a half years ago, we have introduced uh, FDR, which is 56 gigabit per second infiniment uh, network. And uh, not only it uh, gives obviously just raw bandwidth and uh, latency uh, better than 40 gig, uh, here you can see actually the effect on the real applications. So the open form Eclipse and, uh, and uh, uh, LAMPS uh, applications showing significant performance uh, boost running on faster network, and not only just faster, but also it scales better as you add uh, more processes and uh, extend your, cl your cluster to larger amount of the nodes. So uh, these uh, network effects are not, have not gone uh, unattended by uh, uh, data center and data center builders and the people that actually uh, use the cluster to deliver the services. Uh, Microsoft Bing Maps, uh, whoever uses it, and there is a, this is the uh, very short list of uh, companies that allow us to uh, refer them as uh, infiniment customers. They basically uh, talk in public about uh, at least a part of the stuff, how they build their data centers. Uh, there is a, a quite a few additional uh, web to the and uh, cloud companies that view IT as their competitive advantage, and they're much more secretive about how do they build the data centers. Uh, but, you know, PayPal, PayPal uh, Microsoft, and uh, there's um, other companies uh, basically using InfiniBand. And uh, interestingly enough is that one company using InfiniBand cut down uh, data recovery uh, time from a week to four hours. So within a half a day, you can get uh, your database uh, fully recovered in case of a crash rather than a week. And it's uh, obviously have a very significant impact on the business of this company. So the way, uh, to, the way, the way, the way uh, we look at this is that uh, actually the new trend of uh, be being able to deliver the services makes uh, our world better. And, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, analysis is done and a lot of algorithms is done in the healthcare. And uh, it's interesting that, you know, there's a individual patterns, RNA analysis uh, takes seven days. Uh, the goal was to uh, cut it down uh, only by two days. Uh, using InfiniBand, you can actually get the RNA sequence uh, data analysis uh, within the one hour. So you can almost in real time analyze the uh, RNA sequence and uh, obviously draw the uh, conclusions. So uh, we can, uh, using InfiniBand, you can find the pediatric cancer in this particular case uh, much faster and, uh, you know, this can actually save uh, human lives. So on the, talking about a little bit uh, on the, past and the future, uh, Mellanox uh, powers uh, uh, half of the, or a little bit more than half of the uh, petascale computers today uh, across the globe. And uh, the key thing is that it is pretty, pretty much standard off-the-shelf technology using the standard servers and uses standard feedback and interconnect. There is a multiple uh, entities are building very fast machines at uh, uh, fairly low cost. And uh, the biggest uh, machine in terms of the node count that was uh, uh, publicly announced is 20,000 node machine of, uh, of Na uh, in, in NASA. So there is the flat layer two network that connects 20,000 uh, endpoints running about uh, 150,000 uh, cores, CPU cores. 
And uh, this actually in uh, production in NASA for, uh, I think it's either two or three years now, running uh, FDR and uh, QDR and Finiband. And uh, there's multiple scientific and engineering projects uh, running on this machine. Uh, going from high-performance computing space to the cloud, uh, today, people use the cloud provider using the InfiniBand as uh, their uh, network for the cloud. Uh, Oracle, we work with Oracle since about 2002, 2003, since we have uh, actually introduced our first uh, InfiniBand solution. And uh, all the extra logic, extra data, extra everything on low, uh, on, in Oracle running uh, InfiniBand inside uh, with the bridging uh, to Ethernet uh, at high performance bridging. Microsoft uh, uh, Azure running InfiniBand at about 90% 90 per 90 uh, efficiency of the cloud, and uh, it is uh, one th uh, two thirds, so, so saving one third of the application cost. Uh, ProfitBricks, uh, Atlantic Net, and there's other uh, cloud providers uh, running InfiniBand uh, as their network, and uh, the reason they do it is they got much better ROI, return on investment. Uh, using InfiniBand from their uh, infrastructure than uh, using alternative uh, uh, interconnects like Ethernet. Uh, actually, our first customer that we shipped our first InfiniBand uh, device in 2001 was uh, Network Appliance. They uh, used InfiniBand as the backend cluster interconnect to, to connect uh, their head nodes. And uh, since then, we are moving, uh, Infiniment uh, getting more and more adoption in the storage space. Uh, right now, uh, pretty much every storage vendor uh, that building the storage servers are using Infiniment as uh, their cluster interconnect fabric. So you have a, a client connectivity today, it's mostly Ethernet or fiber channel to the storage server, and this storage server is actually built as the cluster of uh, processing nodes with the uh, non-volatile storage behind it, be it uh, flash or uh, uh, rotating disks. And uh, all of them are using InfiniBand for uh, faster access and uh, lower cost and lower power. So, you know, all the big and uh, small storage vendors are using InfiniBand, and uh, actually every, I think, at least in terms of uh, amount of uh, requests that we are, we are getting to uh, explore the technology. Uh, pretty much all the storage startups that are looking at a uh, new uh, paradigm of using flash memory is uh, using, using it filament or looking at filament. So every uh, 2.5 to 3 years, uh, or 2 to 2.5 years, uh, we manage it to uh, bump up uh, the network speed uh, by about factor of two. We introduced uh, 10 gigabit in 2002. About uh, two years later, we introduced 20 gigabit and so on and so forth. Uh, we introduced uh, 56 gigabit at the uh, uh, middle of uh, 2012, so a little bit more than a year and a half. So following this trend, uh, you can basically draw your own conclusion, and uh, we are going to have uh, uh, much higher network performance, 100 gigabit and, uh, and above. Uh, on the on the on the on our roadmap, so uh, the beta scale is the FDR, and the exa scale is going to be EDR and HDR uh, machines, and uh, we are working obviously with the uh, people that are building these machines on the next wave of uh, InfiniBand and uh, Ethernet uh, solutions, and I'll talk about Ethernet uh, explicitly. So uh, going to the higher speed, uh, not saying that 56 gigabit on four lanes running is, uh, is easy. It was really hard. But uh, going even further, uh, then it becomes even harder. Uh, so we are, we are providing the end-to-end -end solution, including cables, uh, since about 2005 or 2004. But uh, we were not designing the cables. We are building the cables using commercially available um, components, and uh, recently, uh, so we, are, we were not owning the IP that is inside the cable, we were buying it and qualifying it. So uh, recently, uh, we bought two companies in the uh, physical layer space in the silicon photonics. 
One is this uh, company is Kotura, another one IPtronics. Kotura is a U.S. company located near Los Angeles. IPtronics is a European car company from Denmark. Uh, these two companies are working have a silicon photonics uh, solutions, and now we basically own all the IP from the uh, very low level, from the cable, from the from the uh, network all the way up to the application interfaces. So we can deliver the full solution, and uh, we will design and qualify this 100 gigabit and beyond uh, interconnects and uh, links in the uh, basically end to end. So the uh, transceivers uh, in the cables uh, will be our design and uh, our IP. Uh, I would like to talk about the recent uh, Connect IB device, which is uh, the first step to the exascale computing. And uh, there are the challenges of uh, scalability on the multiple, uh, multiple fronts, and uh, I'll talk about a couple of them. So it is the seventh generation of uh, Mellanox interconnect adapter architectures. It is a dual port FDR device, uh, but it is capable of uh, pretty much saturating both ports. So it can run uh, 100 gigabit deliver and uh, suck the 100 gigabit per second data rate uh, from the server. And uh, if you look at the IOPS, and actually this is what really uh, gets to the uh, performance, uh, we can deliver, uh, which actually measure it on the real system on the Sandy Bridge machines, uh, 137 million messages per second. So if we talk about uh, I/O operation like you know storage access that takes about three mil three uh, I/O operations, uh, this device uh, can deliver about 50 million I/O operations uh, per second, which is uh, about two orders of magnitude higher than any other uh, network interface that is available today. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we have introduced the dynamically connected uh, transport service, and uh, I'll talk about this uh, in a second. So in terms of uh, uh, just performance, uh, we, are, uh, we, 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 we can saturate uh, two uh, ports of the FDR, so that's uh, 100 gigabit per second, uh, single direction, or uh, 200 gigabit per second uh, uh, bidirectional, and uh, you know if it's uh, about 2x higher than the most advanced ConnectX3 FDR uh, device that is available today, which can saturate only uh, one FDR port. So, and uh, this this uh, capability again, actually, you know, it's uh, showing just bandwidth and uh, and latency is great, but uh, when you go to the uh, real application, if this bandwidth and latency are not deliver it efficiently enough to the application, it uh, basically dwarfs and uh, goes down somewhere, gets lost in the software stack and other inefficiencies. inefficiencies. What you see here is that uh, this is the actual applications running uh, on the uh, Connect IB and uh, Connect X3. And what you see here is that Connect IB uh, delivers better performance and it scales better, and the uh, applications uh, running on the Connect IB, they scale better uh, when you add additional uh, CPU power, which is number of nodes or number of processes. Okay, so one of the impediments of the scalability running uh, in Finibend is uh, uh, the memory footprint of, uh, of the transport or, or the connection context. Infiniband deploys a reliable connected model that was defined in the spec, and uh, it takes some time to establish the connection. So it means that you need to connect all the processes up front, establish the connections all the pro all, uh, to, the, uh, to, to all the communicators up front, which means you need to allocate resources up front. And the amount of resources you, you need to allocate if you uh, if you using the reliable classic reliable connection model in Infinima that was this defined in the first division of the spec, basically you go uh, through the roof of amount of memory you need because every connection has its own uh, uh, context associated with this, so it takes memory, and uh, this memory basically doing nothing because you ca you can build the cluster of hundred thousand endpoints, but you never work or never communicate concurrently with 100,000 uh, endpoints, 
and therefore you, the concurrency of uh, communication is really f uh, function of the CPU power and not function of the indiv individual node and not function of the cluster size. So you established all these connections, you allocated resources, but in, in most cases you use a small fraction of this. So there was a multiple attempts in the Infiniment Trend Association and uh, uh, you know, contextual Mellanox by mitigating this problem. Uh, include, in, in, introduced uh, shared receive queue, this was in 2005, or uh, XRC, Extended uh, Reliable Connected Services, is, is 2008. So the idea behind these developments were to uh, figure out how can we share resources across multiple processes and uh, this way uh, uh, reducing the number of resources you need. So, you know, it, uh, it did the job. The uh, scalability uh, gets a little bit better, but still uh, what was uh, bothered, bothering us is that uh, there is uh, the amount of resources that individual endpoint needs to have for communication is uh, really a function of the, this individual uh, endpoint compute power or the concurrency it can, uh, it can actually deploy, and not the function of how many uh, endpoints you can, you can communicate with. You know, everybody can talk to everybody in the world, but we never talk to more than, you know, interactively at least, to more than a you know, uh, very small number of people. So in the Connect IB, we have uh, introduced uh, what we call dynamically connected transport service, and uh, uh, another way to look at it is on-demand connectivity. Okay, so if you can think about this is that uh, there is the transport that re delivers you all the reliable connected uh, services like RDMA, Atomics, and uh, uh, transport reliability, but it takes zero cost to establish the connection. So if, we need to talk, if I need to talk to some uh, particular uh, endpoint, the connection is established when it's needed and when uh, the messages uh, exchange is, uh, uh, goes away, then connection is steer, the connection is steered down and the resources are deallocated, can be used by another uh, connectivity. So basically you need to allocate as much resources as, can, as the endpoint can handle in, in, in terms of the concurrency it can handle. It has really nothing to do with the amount of uh, endpoints it can communicate to. So it's, uh, as a result, in the Connect IB, the amount of uh, memory that needs to be allocated uh, to communicate is not a function of the size of the cluster, but it's pretty much the function of the concurrency that the individual endpoint can handle, which is, uh, in turn, you know, the function of the CPU power. So we have this now balanced uh, equation between the CPU power, the amount of memory that uh, you know, people build, it's also a function of the CPU power. Uh, and uh, using this on the network doesn't mean that you need to uh, allocate uh, a memory according to the cluster size. Uh, and in terms of latency, this is uh, talking about uh, cost of uh, in, in establishing the connection. What you see here is that uh, latency, which includes the connection establishment, uh, is about less than half of the, uh, of the Connect, Connect X3 device. And, uh, you know, obviously when you go to the large messages, then uh, connection established is even less uh, uh, significant. So it, it shows that this uh, uh, on-demand connectivity, it doesn't cost the performance. So it's the same latency as uh, a reliable connected, uh, but you don't need to allocate resources up front. Uh, another uh, impediment for uh, scalability is uh, some uh, synchronization operations. And uh, what, it, uh, what, it happens, what happens is that uh, when you need to synchronize uh, the operations, then you can't really uh, proceed further when, until all the nodes are synchronized. And if uh, some endpoints had some uh, you know, disturbance like interrupts, or some other uh, jitters, then basically the uh, slowest one uh, dictates the system performance. Uh, OS jitter is, and people uh, in the labs uh, were actually changing the um, uh, operating systems and uh, underlying infrastructure to reduce number interrupts, which was uh, the main source of the OS jitter, but there, and you know, building huge amount of uh, memory, so uh, uh, 
page faults uh, will not uh, uh, change, uh, will not uh, have a uh, big impact on the on GD, jitter. But uh, basically, uh, at the end of the day, it always exists. And if you do the barrier and collective operation on the same uh, under the same on the same infrastructure, which means uh, in the CPU running on uh, in the application running on top of operating system that runs on the CPU, uh, you get this uh, jitter and the slowest one uh, covers. So what we have done, we have uh, uh, implemented, uh, along with uh, our friends in uh, Oracle uh, Oak Ridge uh, National Lab, uh, we have uh, uh, developed uh, what we call Core Direct, which means you can actually offload uh, the synchronization operation to the NIC. You program it up front. And uh, therefore, if uh, I'm running, uh, I, I, the, the CPU on the individual, individual endpoint uh, doesn't need to be a middleman and uh, in, uh, participate in the synchronization operation. Basically, synchronization operation is uh, implemented uh, in the network uh, in the, by the hardware that is designed uh, in the network adapter, and it doesn't inter interfere with the processor. So here is uh, the example uh, of uh, operations. Uh, you know, it's the time goes uh, from bottom up. So what you see here, there was uh, some operation that ideally uh, these operations were completed at the same time. Then uh, it, uh, the barrier uh, takes effect. So now all this, uh, this uh, usually goes on the tree. Each one runs on the CPU and uh, then notify to all the endpoints that uh, synchronization is done and uh, they keep running. So in reality, what happens, each one of these uh, uh, endpoints got some other jitter, got, got some jitter, and as a result, this jitter is particularly uh, bothering because this guy, this guy is done. But the, by the time he could take care about the message that was sent from the, uh, from the leaf of the tree, <coughs> there was a jitter introduced that you can actually, that you have to uh, wait, and therefore this jitter is actually a uh, direct hit on the performance. What you see here is that uh, these stars, it means that every nick on the endpoint was pre-programmed to take care about the uh, collective operation, so this guy, can start off here, and despite of this uh, jitter, it executes the collective operation and sends the result uh, to the, to the uh, other endpoints. So you can actually see that uh, jitter, uh, uh, jitter effect uh, is taken care, ca taken care of, and uh, overall system performance uh, improves. Uh, this is another example. If you use uh, uh, synchronous versus uh, asynchronous operation, when you want to even further overlap communication and and uh, and synchronization, you can actually uh, every time uh, you get to the barrier, actually your uh, NIC will do the job on its own, and uh, you can go directly to the uh, next iteration or next uh, next step of the process. So this is. Uh, this is the example uh, uh, that uh, actually using Core Direct, you can ha have much higher overlap uh, between communication and, uh, and uh, computation than not using Core Direct because basically you, you program the, this hardware in the uh, network to do the synchronization and the CPU is uh, free to, to execute on the application. Uh, about Three years ago, maybe four years ago, uh, people started to use uh, GPU as the floating point uh, number cruncher. Uh, cruncher. There is a, a huge amount of uh, floating point units uh, in the GPU, and uh, people actually started to use it uh, in the scientific uh, calculations. The first uh, uh, GPUs that were used didn't have, um, you know, uh, 60, didn't, didn't support double precision. It was really uh, oriented the graphics, but uh, once uh, people started to use a GPU in the uh, scientific applications, the now pretty much every GPU supports uh, IEEE uh, floating point standard. And, uh, but uh, when you use the GPU, uh, there is an intrinsic inefficiency in, in the, in when you uh, cluster GPUs. The way uh, GPU is designed is that it is uh, uh, DMA's data to memory and from memory. And uh, then you cannot share, you know, the original design over here, 
you, uh, if you want to send this data to the network, so the, the idea is that you know there is a multiple GPUs running on the different endpoints, and they uh, uh, the data flows in, in between the compute engines. So in order to send the data that was calculated by uh, by one GPU uh, to uh, the next step on the other endpoint to be calculated by another GPU, what you need to do you need to copy the data from the GPU to GPU buffer, then copy it from the uh, GPU buffer to the network buffer and then send it out. And on the receive side, it's uh, basically you're doing the same copies but uh, in different order. And this uh, red one is uh, the most uh, painful one because uh, this is what CPU actually does on its own. This uh, step is done by the uh, GPU DMA. Uh, this step is done by the NIC DMA. But the uh, red arrow is actually CPU uh, moving byte byte from uh, one memory location to other. So working with the uh, uh, GPU vendors, and uh, by that time it was uh, basically in, you know, only NVIDIA, now Intel also uh, joins the pack, uh, by uh, changing the uh, software model and, uh, and uh, mainly on the GPU, but also on the, on the uh, uh, network uh, driver, uh, we allow to share uh, the GPU and uh, network buffers so we got rid of uh, the most painful uh, part of this uh, GPU to GPU communication. So GPU writes data to the memory and the NIC can take the uh, data from the memory directly and uh, send it to the other side. Uh, it is really important that uh, this site uh, supports uh, RDMA or, uh, you know, a a as a target because it, the data has to be placed in the right place. Uh, if it's uh, just a sim sim uh, single, simple uh, interface, uh, then you need always copy from the network buffer to the uh, real destination buffer. This is the zero copy story on the network in general. And then uh, GPU DMA can take it uh, down. So this is the first step where we've implemented the most, uh, the improved the most painful step in the GPU to GPU communication. But uh, there are still some uh, meat left because GPU has a memory and the data is move, moved from the GPU memory to the CPU memory and then from the CPU memory to the host memory and then from the host memory to the network and the other side is the same. So there is an additional uh, inefficient store and forward step because ideally what you would want to do, you would take the data from the GPU and run it directly on the network. So this uh, required some uh, additional changes uh, because uh, both GPU and the NIC, they are designed to be DMA master and not DMA slave. The GPU vendors uh, changed this uh, or up, up, updated their design uh, so GPU can be uh, not only GPU master but also GPU slave. And uh, NIC can actually pull the data directly from the GPU memory and send it out and write it to the GPU memory directly on the, on the other part. So uh, uh, DK Panda, is, he's here, was here yesterday. Uh, uh, this are our old uh, friend from uh, Ohio State University. He is the champion in the high performance computing in the academia. Uh, basically, uh, they're showing that there is a significant uh, improvement both in latency and the bandwidth if I uh, use a GPU direct. But uh, this is not the end of the, uh, so yeah, this is another example of uh, not only, you know, uh, the nuts and bolts and, uh, you know, like people call hero number of the performance showing the latency and, uh, and bandwidth. Uh, this is uh, also the execution of uh, application. And you see that uh, GPU direct uh, uh, helps uh, and improves the performance on the real application. Okay, so but that's not the on the the the, uh, the story uh, today. If you use uh, if you want to use GPU, you need to equip every uh, server with the with the GPU hardware, and uh, the usage of the GPU and uh, the efficiency of using the GPU is uh, uh, is not explored to the full extent that you've seen actually on the top of final list that the GPU based server's efficiency is uh, lower than uh, than others, and the reason is that you know you basically compute how much theoretical flops you can get, and there is a tremendous amount of flops you can get from the GPU, and then how much it's actually exposed in the application by uh, running Linpack in this case. So uh, we have uh, looked at this, and uh, we thought that, you know, like people 
used to have disks local, and then now you have uh, disks on, over the network. And uh, the reason you can do it, and it actually efficient, efficiently because the network access uh, is negligible. Ti the time of the next network access, the bandwidth that you can get from the network, is uh, sufficient to, uh, so latency is uh, negligible and bandwidth is uh, same as the uh, disk, disk bandwidth, so you can actually uh, run the disk access over the network. That's not the case uh, for the you know, traditional networks, that's not the case uh, for the high performance IO devices like GPU. Uh, GPU performance depends on the both latency and the bandwidth of, uh, uh, of the connectivity to the application memory and uh, therefore running uh, GPU uh, as the service or remote access to the GPU on traditional network is not something that uh, can be perceived as attractive. With the FDR and Finiband, uh, the, both the latency and the bandwidth of uh, accessing over the network becomes to be in the same ballpark of local access on the PCI Express. And uh, what we have done with uh, our friends from uh, University of Spain is uh, we have implemented uh, GPU as a service or basically tunneling the GPU uh, commands, CUDA commands, over the network to the GPU which is physically located on the different node than the uh, client uh, application processor. It's called Darkuda, so you can imagine that like uh, be SCSI commands being tunneled through the network for uh, for uh, uh, block device over the network. Here we are tunneling uh, GPU uh, commands and uh, data over the network to the GPU that is uh, located on, on the on the other side of the network. So this is uh, this is uh, this was, th this was done uh, through the Infiniment FDR switches. And uh, what you can see here, this is the, again, the hero numbers of uh, throughput in terms of megabyte per second. Uh, uh, what, you, what, what you can get, uh, obviously the uh, Ethernet doesn't cut it. There is a lot of bandwidth uh, that's not used on the network that you can use locally. And if you go to the uh, InfiniBand, then... Uh, you, with the FDR and Finiment, you get uh, very close to what you can actually, in, in terms of bandwidth from, uh, versus what you can get on the local GPU access from the, uh, on the uh, server itself. And this is another uh, example for this from the raw numbers this is to the application uh, uh, time for matrix matrix products multiplying uh, 4,000, uh, you know, 4K by 4K matrices. If you use it... Uh, on the local GPU and on the remote GPU, the performance is uh, very similar. If you run it over the uh, traditional network, you better off just use uh, local CPU uh, to, cut, to, to compute it. So GPU over the network gives uh, pretty much the same performance boost as, uh, uh, as the local GPU, uh, but the advantage of having GPU over the network is now you can share this GPU hardware across multiple endpoints. So everyone that needs the GPU services can go to this uh, uh, GPU, uh, end, uh, GPU uh, server and, uh, and get his, uh, his own GPU services. So once this technology will be deployed, I believe the GPU uh, utilization numbers on the top 500 will uh, go significantly up. So some other developments. Uh, since 2007, we started the company and our first uh, multiple product generations were InfiniBand. And uh, since 2007, we uh, got to the Ethernet space with uh, what we call, uh, oh sorry, that's, that's just, uh, uh, there's another example of the storage, the VDI is uh, uh, using, using RDMA you can host uh, uh, 2x more VMs or 2.5x more VMs on the server, on the sim single server than uh, otherwise, so you can have a, a much more efficient data center. Oh, this is uh, sort of tight, uh, connect, connected to the Ethernet. Uh, we have introduced our first uh, Ethernet device uh, in 2007, and uh, actually all our hardware uh, can run either Ethernet or Infiniment uh, protocol. We call it VPI, Virtual Protocol Interconnect. And uh, when we get to the, uh, uh, to the enterprise data center and the storage, so people are uh, not 
Not everybody is uh, willing to replace their Ethernet networks with InfiniBand, but uh, having much more efficient interfaces for the application access to the network is attractive. So therefore, we can run uh, InfiniBand stack or expose RDMA interfaces over either Ethernet or InfiniBand, and uh, uh, we can run, uh, obviously, all the uh, Ethernet protocols and uh, running iSCSI over RDMA significantly improves uh, performance and uh, uh, both in latency and the bandwidth and the IOPS uh, versus using it uh, uh, over, over, over Ethernet. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, one example that you can actually run a uh, storage server and the compute server and you can get from the uh, virtual, virtual machine uh, data rate close to the to the wire uh, to the wire speed of the network. Uh, our Ethernet developments are covering which again we have end-to-end uh, -end, uh, Ethernet solutions. I think we are the only, only company uh, that can uh, provide 40 gigabit Ethernet both uh, on the endpoint NIC and uh, and the switch. Uh, on the Ethernet, however, uh, there is the fairly significant amount of uh, uh, software and services that are exist in the network. And the way it's the delivered today is the uh, classic uh, Ethernet companies like you know, Cisco, Juniper, and the like. They uh, provide vertical solution, and uh, you know, it uh, uh, resembles the early days of the computing where you could got the box with the operating system and with the applications, and you can't really uh, touch and uh, uh, do the mix and match in different components. So we have, uh, uh, we're now driving the initiative, uh, it's called Open Ethernet, uh, and uh, actually we are not the only one, there is a, the whole industry momentum behind it. Uh, there are some multiple companies that are delivering uh, different uh, components on the network stack on the switches, and uh, the key is to uh, put together the standard interfaces and the framework so you can mix and match uh, different components and different services from different vendors. For example, you know, if you uh, like uh, RSN layer 2 stack and you want you know, uh, Quagga or uh, some other uh, layer 3 stack, today you can, you, can't, uh, you can do it with the open internet. You can actually mix, mix and match different components. And uh, this is uh, uh, resembles of what is being done in the uh, Linux and, o and open source communities. So you can take the different models, the interfaces are well defined, and you can uh, uh, basically integrate the solution uh, on your own and not necessarily uh, taking it from the vendor. Uh, actually, this is what uh, uh, Web2.0 and uh, cloud companies are doing. Uh, both of, uh, all of these uh, companies from the both places are uh, departing from uh, buying uh, e expensive network equipment from uh, classical uh, network vendors like uh, like Cisco, and uh, they're uh, buying bare metal uh, switches and uh, bolt their software on top of it. So the key here is the framework and the interface, and that's what we are driving, and we actually submitted our APIs to the community already. So the open internet will, uh, will enable to, like, you know, in, 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 uh, in Linux there is a NetDev interface and you can put any, any NIC underneath that, uh, presuming that it, uh, this NIC has the uh, driver that exposes this interface, and uh, you can run any network application on top of it. So the idea here is uh, uh, very similar. So we are, we are uh, having the, we are standardizing the uh, NetDev equivalent uh, for the switches uh, in the community and uh, with on, on top of this interface, everybody can run its own uh, uh, software stack. So, you know, going back, uh, so far we have been able to introduce the network speed up every two, two, two and a half years. Uh, and we are po fully poised to uh, keep going. So we are going to introduce 100 gigabit EDR speed and, uh, and further, further up. And uh, I think exascale uh, machine will uh, need somewhere north of 400 gigabit per second uh, networks. And uh, we are 
in the development stages of delivering it on, on time. That's about it. Yeah. Okay. What's the relation with the open flow okay. Op uh, op open flow is uh, uh, is the protocol or the way to communicate to the switches, and uh, actually it's very synergetic with open internet because you need to have an interface that is exposed by the switch, so open flow controller can program the uh, the device. So uh, you know our marketing guys can uh, elaborate about the list of the companies uh, they are aware of much better than I, uh, that I do about this particular companies who is uh, part of the open internet uh, uh, initiative. Uh, I can mention you know Cumulus for example. This is the classic uh, open internet uh, uh, or you know the the, the the spirit of open internet. Uh, PK8 is another one, and uh, there is a companies that are actually building their own equipment, as I mentioned, web 2 uh, these guys are uh, fully behind uh, this initiative. They just need the standard interface to, the, to get to the, to the network and uh, all the rest they're doing on their own. Yeah? So you said that uh, when you use FDR, you have to use this custom CPU utilization. But comparatively, you're going to be the party can be in one of your slides, you said with the Inky band of VR, you get 96% CPU utilization. On the same slide, you said with the Ethernet, you get like 50 to 80%. Is that a convenient speed or a quality speed? Well, uh, the, 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 the main thing about uh, when we talk about Ethernet and Infinimate in this context, it's not only just the link layer okay, and, the, and the speed of the wire, but it's also the uh, traditional software stack that runs on top of Ethernet. So it includes, for example, TCP. Now, we have, uh, uh, you know, on different slides, there's uh, uh, different Ethernet uh, uh, references. Uh, I think it's mostly 10 gig. There are some uh, on the on the GPU director was uh, uh, one gig, uh, but the issue with the CPU utilization uh, on the 10 gig Ethernet is uh, uh, the transport stack. So if you go to the 40 gig, then the problem is getting even worse because it's pretty much per packet or per few packets uh, the overhead, and when you have uh, more packets per second, then CPU needs to work harder to process them. <laughs> 